It is what it is, but yeah, unfortunately we have to do what we got to do. Take care, hon. I'm here. started this morning. Uh, we got a couple quick announcements. Uh, first, if you are visiting with us for the very first time, there are connect cards on the back of each chair, so we would love for you to fill out that information um, so that we can get in contact with you, let you know a little bit about our church uh, and how we grow disciples who worship, serve, and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we got two events coming up this week. Uh, first, on Saturday at 9.30 a.m. at Jamie's house, Right there. Uh, we are having a women's tea party. Uh, there will be delectable foods that are going to be absolutely delightful. And so come on out uh, for some fantastic fellowship there. Uh, and then also this Saturday, uh, starting at 10 a.m., is our second serving food distribution. And so if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact Frank or Debbie Gossett. Uh, that's it for announcements. We are in the dead of summer, so it's hot. We want to uh, keep these announcements short uh, so that we can get worshiping this morning. Um, so if you can go ahead and join me for prayer, uh, we'll get rolling here. Uh, so Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. Um, your beauty and your grace, may that shine in our hearts this morning. Uh, Lord, we, we ask that uh, you would be blessed by this service, um, that it would fulfill us. Uh, that it would invigorate us to chase after you even harder. Um, knowing that you are everywhere, knowing that you care about us, knowing that you have uh, chosen to love us despite our own sin. Um, you are a, a loving God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, just take a moment and say hello to your neighbor. Did we meet and drink already? Did I miss it? Let's meet and drink. <laughs>
morning. Good morning. Well, we know what the bass player is preaching. <laughs> Um, so Joel uh, is on vacation right now uh, with the kids, um, what are you, in Colorado, I believe, yeah. Uh, so he tapped me on the shoulder six or eight weeks ago, thank goodness, uh, because he asked me to preach on the omnipresence of God. And that's not a targeted subject to talk about, and I actually thought about this for a long time before I was able to actually put some, um, some meat and some bones to this together. So. Um, I'll start by sharing this story. Uh, there was a young man that had come into this church. He came in, he had just a kind of a crumpled old t-shirt up, his hair was kind of unkempt, uh, had some holes in his jeans and some sandals. And he walks down and he sits at the front of the, of the sanctuary and listens to the sermon. The service is over, he gets up and there, you know, the pastor's back at the back door greeting everybody to go out. And the young man says to the pastor, he says, that was amazing, I really loved that, that sermon. He goes, I think I'm going to come back next week. And the pastor says, well, that's fantastic. He goes, hey, listen, I want you to, to pray this week. And he goes, sure. He goes, I want you to pray about, ask God what you think you should be wearing to church. <laughs> so the young man goes home. Sure enough, he comes back the next week. Here he comes back down to the same, in front of the sanctuary again. He's dressed the same. He's got his homely T-shirt on. Might have been a different T-shirt, jeans, sandals. End of the service happens, he goes over, he's telling to the pastor, he says, you just knocked it out of the park again, pastor. And he says, well, thank you so much. He goes, by the way, did you have a chance to ask God about what he thought you should wear to church? He goes, oh, yeah, I did. And he goes, well, what did he say? Well, he apologized, but he said, he never been to this church before. <laughs> So we're going to prove that wrong, that God is actually in every church this morning, okay? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for this opportunity to bring your word, Lord. I just ask that you would fill my, my heart and my, my mouth with the words that you would have spoken. I'd ask for the Holy Spirit to be among us and that the congregation be receptive to this message. We thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. I have these just in case. I get here and I can't read what I've written. Um, so, I got this uh, call to preach this, this message. And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, and the very first thing that came to my mind was a song that I learned as a child. And you may have learned this too. He knows when you've been sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness. And I wasn't in Sunday school and I learned that, but that's, that's as close as I could come. So we're going to work through that a little bit this morning. Uh, we're going to start where a lot of places start, uh, just with a definition. So, omnipresence, um, according to Merriam-Webster, you're present in all places at all times. And the synonym for that is ubiquitous. It's existing or being everywhere at the same time, constantly encountered. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning is, is God and can God be present everywhere all the time? And I think hopefully we'll come up with the answer is yes, right? Um, before we get into what the Bible says, I do want to talk about, there are some unorthodox views about, uh, about the omnipresence of God. Um, if you bring the next one up, there's deism. And you may have heard deism uh, specified. It's a belief in God based on reason rather than revelation or the teaching of any specific religion. A form of naturalism, natural religion, deism originated in England in the early 17th century as a rejection of Orthodox Christianity. Deists asserted that reason could find evidence of God in nature and that God had created the world and then left it to operate under the natural laws he had devised. By the late 18th century, deism was the dominant religious attitude among Europe's educated classes. It was accepted by many upper-class Americans of the same era, including Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. So deism says they believe in God but this God created this world and this universe, and then he went off and left us to our own devices. Um, this belief system came about to make sense of the power struggles between the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of England, uh, wars over religion, the severe treatment of Protestants, uh, including the Inquisition, and an effort to get out from under the strict moral codes of denominations such as the Pilgrims and the Puritans. And I think that last 
line is, is kind of the most important. All these things are usually to get out to being having something authority over us that we have to quote follow some rules. We just want to live our lives and we don't want God to be inter interjecting in that. But that's not what the Bible says. <clears throat> so, looking for the verses that support the omnipresence of God, I have to be uh, honest with you, it's, it was a internet search because if it's on the internet, it has to be true. <laughs> so the most, uh, the most um, pointed and complete uh, passage is in Psalm 139, 7 through 10. It says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. So there's no place that we can go that we can be apart from God. For good or for worse. Right? Some people want to be away from God. <clears throat> um, with these set of verses, we begin to understand how vast and expansive God is, and that he pr promises to be anywhere that we are. He's there when we are born. He's there when we're married. He's there when we have children. He's there when our parents pass away. He's there when we are divorced or widowed. He's there in our abundance and in our poverty. He's there in our good health and in our sickness. And most especially, he's there when we die. He's always there for us. Now, coming back to my initial, uh, initial song, he knows when you've been bad. <laughs> Job 34, 4, 21 through 22 says, His eyes are on the ways of mortals. He sees their every step. There is no deep shadow, no utter darkness where evildoers can hide. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. Jeremiah 23, 24, Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heaven and the earth? Hebrews 4.13 Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So on the bad side, he knows when we're bad, right? He knows when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Some biblical examples. Uh, Adam and Eve. You know, he asked, uh, who told you? that you could eat this fruit, or why did you eat this fruit? He knew, this was a rhetorical question, right? He didn't talk and he didn't know. David and Bathsheba, he knew of their sin, what had happened. Achan, maybe you guys don't know the story of Achan, but when the Israelites first came into the Promised Land, the first place they took was Jericho. And God said to them, do not take any of the spoils, those are consecrated to me. Well, Achan thought he was maybe just kidding. He said, we can't be really true. That's, that, that's okay, right. So, so he saw something and he took it. So they went out to fight for the next battle, the next town, and they were defeated very harshly. And now they came back, Lord, you brought us into this land. What are we going to do? You know, we, we're not being successful. And God told Joshua, he says, you've got somebody in your, your midst that took uh, something that was supposed to be consecrated to me. And so they went through this, they brought out each family and each clan, and they got down to um, Achan's family, and uh, he, he admitted it, I guess, to his, um, uh, maybe his salvation, but not, not really. Uh, and they put Achan and his entire family to death, and then they were successful on the rest of their, um, their journey to the, prom uh, to the promised land. So, God saw that. Name and Elisha and Gehazi. Name is the story of the... Um, uh, the official, uh, Syrian official, uh, Assyria, and he had leprosy. And his his uh, servant said, you know, uh, there's a man in, in, in Judah that can, in, can can heal you of that. So he goes, he told him to go and walk base seven times in the, in the Jordan, right? So um, he's healed, he comes to Elijah, and he's, Elisha, excuse me, and he says, you know, what can I give you? And he says, nothing, you know, just go on your way. Well, Gehazi runs after him and says, hey, Elisha changed his mind. And so he comes back to, uh, uh, to Elisha, and then uh, the, the Spirit of God told Elisha, no, this is Eli um, um, Gehazi has done this. And so he knew that action. And Ananias and Sapphira is from the, old, uh, from the New Testament. 
uh, in the new church. Uh, they were selling their properties and bringing everything to the Lord. And uh, so Ananias uh, comes in and um, says that he had sold his property, but he didn't give everything. And God knew that and dropped dead right there. So when we talk about our tithing this morning, um, <laughs> the thing, same thing happens to fire, right? So, so God saw all this. He was, he was in the midst of all that. Um, because we live, in a fall, we live in a fallen world, we're likely to brush up against evil in some person or, or circumstance. And God is present for all of this. So I, um, I teach, uh, I took a quick little sabbatical this, this um uh, spring, but I teach a, um, well, I say I facilitate a key group uh, on Monday nights here. And uh, um, my work schedule, I, I, I work at home, I eat lunch at home Monday through Thursday, but on Fridays I always want to go out for lunch. And uh, Kathy was working uh, more um, a while back than she is now. We have lunch together on Fridays, and that's very, that's very good. Uh, but I used to um, prepare for my, um, my key group study on Friday during that lunch. So I would take my Bible to whatever restaurant I was going to, and I had my study that I was doing. I'm writing out notes and everything. So there's a, a little restaurant called Papa's. Uh, it's a Greek restaurant up in Citrus Park. And it was a pretty day. Um, I was sitting outside, and uh, the guy that was kind of cleaning off the tables, uh, he'd gone by a couple times, and he finally stopped back by, and he says, hey, I see you're reading your Bible. He goes, uh, my, um, tell me what the Bible says about this. He says, my uh, brother and sister, uh, well, no, my, my sister and her husband are kind of taking control of our mother's finances. Our mother's not in good health. And he goes, I'm, I'm kind of beside myself. I want to confront them. And he goes, what does the Bible say about that? <laughs> and uh, this wasn't for me. This was the Holy Spirit comes and says, real quick, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I say, you leave that up to God. Our job is to love them, and God takes care of everything else. About a month later, I was sitting there doing the same thing, and he came by, and he goes, I gotta tell you, I did what you said. Um, I went, and I didn't make a big deal of it. I just, I just made like it was a normal relationship between us. My, our mother has passed away, but the, the finances are being taken care of well, and he says, thank you for your, um, your admonition and your, 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 um, your suggestions. So, in all these things where God knows when you've been bad, and we know those people might have been bad. Just remember, God's going to take care of it. Our job is just to, to love those people through it. But here's some good news. He knows when you've been good. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Matthew 6.6 6 says, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Matthew 18.20 For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. And the next one, uh, I think, is the most poignant. Acts 17.24-27 The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if anything needed, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. And this is an important verse for me. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. So in this passage, God wants a relationship with us. He wants us to reach out to him and find him. He's not far from us. Uh, Kathy and I were driving somewhere this week, and um, she said, what do you think it means to be made in God's image? And I said, well, I think it means that we are separated from the rest of the animal kingdom in some way. Uh, and I think some of the, one of the main ways is, is we, we can create. God is a creator. We create music. We create poetry. Um, we create architecture, right? We have that, that ability within us. And I think that's part of God's image. But I think one of the other ways is that he made us to be relational. Um, we're searching for relationships. We need relationships. And God wants that relationship with us as well. But unfortunately, 
too often you are looking for love in all the wrong places. All right, we talked about God. Um, I've, I read a lot. Uh, just recently had finished this book, the, the Spurgeon on the Power of Scripture. So Charles Spurgeon has had about six or seven different uh, script, uh, sermons that he preached. Um, I heard a funny story the other, uh, a while back. I also listen to a radio program every day when I walk my dog. It's uh, um, by a pastor named Alistair Begg. Uh, he's up in Cleveland. He's Scottish. Uh, he, when you listen to him, it sounds like you're listening to Shrek. <laughs> and when you see him, he looks like Paul McCartney. <laughs> but he told a story of D.L. Moody and, and Charles Spurgeon. Now, these were the two uh, most prominent pastors, uh, preachers in the uh, 19th century, right? And so Moody was in Chicago, Spurgeon was in London, and uh, there apparently was a small bit of friction with them. It seems that Spurgeon liked to smoke cigars. And Moody would challenge him on that. He says, why are you smoking cigars, you know? And he goes, well, there's nothing to bother about that. And he says, I don't do it to excess. And, and Moody says, well, what do you define as excess? And Spurgeon says, well, I don't smoke twice or two at one time. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought this, this, this is from a particular uh, a sermon uh, that, I, that I was reading. It says, did you ever hear a sermon as to which you felt that if Jesus had come into that pulpit while the man was making his oration, he would have said, go down, go down, what business have you here? I sent you to preach about me, and you preach about a dozen other things. Go home and learn of me, and then come and talk. That sermon does not lead to Christ, or of which Jesus Christ is not the top and the bottom. It is a sort of sermon that will make the devils in hell laugh, but might make the angel of God to weep if they were capable, capable of such emotion. You remember the story I told you of the Welshman who heard a young man preach a very fine sermon, a grand sermon, a highfalutin spread eagle sermon. And when he had done, he asked the Welshman what he thought of it. The man replied that he did not think anything of it. And why not? Because there was no Jesus Christ in it. Well, said he, but my text did seem to run that way. Never mind, said the Welshman, your sermon ought to run that way. I do not see that, however, said the young man. No, said the Welshman, you do not see how to preach yet. This is the way to preach. From every little village in England, it does not matter where it is, there is sure to be a road to London. Though there may not be a road to certain other places, there is certain to be a road to London. Now from every text in the Bible, there is a road to Jesus Christ. And the way to preach it is just to say, how can I get from this text to Jesus Christ? And then go preaching all the way along it. Well, but, said the young man, suppose I find a text that has not got a road to Jesus Christ. I have preached for 40 years, said the old man, and I have never found such a scripture. But if I ever do find one, I will go over hedge and ditch, but that I will get to him, for I will never finish without bringing in my master. I tell you what, I, I've heard a lot of preaching that, that didn't have the influence of Jesus Christ. So, we're going to talk about Jesus Christ. <laughs> Is God ever not omnipresent? Next slide, please. Here it is, Christmas in July. Was Jesus omnipresent when he was in a human body? I've never thought about that before, have you? I had never thought about it before, before either. To me, Jesus stepped out of eternity and took the form of man and walked among us. That would seem to make him lose his omnipresence while here on earth. But I found there was quite a debate around this. Uh, next slide, please. I came across a, um, a doctrine, might say, called Extra Calvinisticum. And it sounds like it's part of Mary Poppins. Uh, super Calvinistic. Extra Calvinisticum. Yeah. So Calvin stated, the Son of God descended from heaven in such a way that without leaving heaven, he willed to be born in the virgin's womb, to go about the earth and to hang upon the cross. Yet, he continuously filled the world even as he had done from the beginning. John Calvin. Um, I'm not sure if there's a uh, slide for this. No, maybe not. Uh, this is uh, from Gavin Ortland. With that statement, oh, here it is, yeah. 
The one the manger is both swallowed tightly, yet filling the heavens. Clinging to his mother, yet holding every atom in place. Crying for comfort, yet sustaining the stars. And sleeping among the donkeys, adored by the angels. Philippians 2, 6 through 7 says, Who, being in the very form of God, the form God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very form of a servant, being made in human likeness. So I'm kind of still on the fence here. I'm still saying, you know what, I think that makes Jesus maybe not omnipresent in some ways. He's still omniscient. If you remember the story of the, of the guys that brought their buddy, who was paralyzed, they got up on the roof, this is in Mark, Mark 2, and they dug a hole in the roof and they lowered him down. It says, now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So he had said to the man, you know, your sins are forgiven. And it says, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to, uh, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority to, on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everything, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So God, uh, Jesus was omniscient in this, in this area. Another passage in John 4, the woman at the well. He knew all about what that woman had been through. He knew about all of her past life, her, her husband that she had, the husband she had now who wasn't a husband. Um, so he knew all about, all about that. So he's still omniscient. Uh, one side thing, I, I, not, not too long ago, it, it kind of came to me. Uh, probably didn't come to me. I probably heard of somebody speak about it. But chapter 3 in John, we have a Pharisee coming to, to Jesus. Nicodemus, right? And uh, he's, he's coming to find out about God and, and about access to God. Immediately afterward, chapter 4, we have this woman who comes out to the well by herself because she's kind of been discarded by her society. So we have the highly religious person and the not religious at all person. Both need Jesus. And we all need Jesus, no matter what our state or status is. Um, the truth is, only bad people go to heaven. Do you believe that? <laughs> the devil would have us say, only good people go to heaven. But the Bible says, there's no one who does good, not even one. So the good news is, that Jesus has reached out with an offer of redemption so that we can come into the presence of God forever. So all you bad people out here, you have a chance. <laughs> Alright, was Jesus still omnipotent? Yes, he was still omnipotent. He turned water into wine. He walked on water. He calmed the storm. He healed the blind, the lame, and the lepers. But Jesus was not in multiple places at the same time while he was on earth, physically. Uh, even when he sent his disciples across the Sea of Galilee, he did not simply reappear in the next location. He walked across the Sea of Galilee, okay, that's pretty pretty amazing, but he still was in his person as he did that, yeah? Uh, Tom Sugamura from New Life Church in Wounded Hills says, if not human, he could not have died. If not divine, he could not have been our sinless substitute. Only the perfect God-man could have saved us through his death. So, what do we make of this? Was Jesus omnipresent or not omnipresent? One of the things that I've learned from Alistair Begg, one of his key phrases is, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. So if it's not plain, we really shouldn't be spending too much time on it. Let's focus on the main things that we know that Jesus was here to teach us. <clears throat> All right, we have another God, don't we? The Holy Spirit. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. We first see the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1-2. Um, I'll go back to that first that slide before. Oh, I did say that. Okay. Sorry. Um, Genesis 1-2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. 
So we see the spirit of, of the Holy Spirit right away in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit's purpose is to dwell with us and comfort us and help us in our prayers when we don't even know how to pray. The Holy Spirit can give us strength that we did not know we had and comfort where we can find no other comfort. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would go into somebody and come out and go into somebody else and come out, right? Um, Samson's a good um, example of this. There's others. Um, Elijah um, was one as well. But in the New Testament, because of Christ's sacrifice and, and Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to us, as Christians, when we become Christians, now we have the Holy Spirit is indwelling within us. We're walking around with the Holy Spirit with us at all times. Um, so I, I've, I've used this, uh, well, first off, the Holy Spirit helps us become more Christ-like, right? And so that process is the, the $10 word is sanctification. Um, helps us become more Christ-like by initially helping us to turn from our worldly ways, that's repentance, and through Bible study, prayer, worship, fellowship, service, and evangelism, we ultimately become more like Christ. It's a, it's a process, right, that we have to go through, and the Holy Spirit is there to help us. So, the last time I preached, I used this passage, and I'm going to use it again because I love this passage. Um, C.S. Lewis uh, remarked on this. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes to rebuild that house. Right? The Holy Spirit has entered into our lives. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably. It does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. Hopefully God is transforming you in that way, that you're becoming a palace. Moving out all these things that you don't need, uh, edifying the things that, that you do need, and, and making a proper place for the Holy Spirit to reside. What time is it? Because I'm almost done. <laughs> you know, uh, when I was uh, um, younger, I uh, in Baptist church, and the, the preacher would always come up and take his watch off very beautifully and put it on the, the pulpit, right, so they keep him in line. They never looked at that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, through God and his omnipresence, omnipresence um, we get these. He's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. He's Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Jehovah Ra, the Lord our shepherd. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. And Jehovah Shema, the Lord is here. With Jesus, we get something that's relational. He's a brother. We are, adop we are adopted into God's family. He's our friend. What a friend we have in Jesus, yeah? He knew pain and joy. He knew fellowship and aloneness. He knew acceptance and rejection. And he knew love and hate. He's our Savior. He was able to lead a blameless life. He provided the perfect sacrifice and he reigns in heaven and earth. Revelation 3.20 says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person. And they with me. So I referenced the song earlier that Johnny Lee famously sang. And I kind of looked it up. And it's kind of interesting if you look at it from a Christian perspective. He said, this is the chorus, I was looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for love in too many faces, searching their eyes, looking for traces of what I'm dreaming of, hoping to find a friend and a lover, 
I'll bless the day I discover another heart looking for love. And then Link, let's take it to the bridge. <laughs> you came knocking on my heart's door. You're everything I've been looking for. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. Anyone opens the door, I'll come in and suck with him. King James Bible says, You came knocking on my heart's door. You're everything I've been looking for. Now, the, the chorus is a little different now. No more looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many places. Searching your eyes, looking for traces of what I'm dreaming of. Now that I've found a friend and a lover, and I would say a lover of my soul, I bless the day I discover you, oh you, looking for love. It's amazing what you can find in pop lyrics, huh? So through the Holy Spirit's omnipresence, he provides comfort, he's our comforter, he's our helper, he's our advocate, and he dwells within each of us, working on building that palace. And one more note, Satan is not omnipresent. Satan can't be everywhere at once, and neither can his demons. But when he comes upon you, you have the power of Jesus Christ to tell him to get behind you. So keep that in mind when next time you feel threatened or um, something out of your control. Just, just remember that Jesus is omnipresent in that regard. Right? So, maybe you've heard some of these things many times before. Um, maybe you come to church a lot. Uh, I heard um, we had a, a assistant pastor at another church he said, um, Sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in your garage makes you a car. <laughs> <laughs> so there are things that we need to accept and understand. Uh, would you like to have the Holy Spirit indwelling in, in you? The only way you get the Holy Spirit indwelling in you is to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Accept that sacrifice that he made for you that would clean you up, get rid of that junk that you cannot walk into the presence of God with. Um, so if you're in that situation where you've heard this message before but have never responded, I urge you um, to pray about that. I, I will be available after I get done playing. Um, after I get done playing for you, you can come and talk to me if you have any questions. Uh, I'll be happy to pray over this with you. Colin, are you in, in the room? Yeah, there he is. Uh, you can talk to Colin. Uh, talk to Mary Joe. Um, we'll be happy to... to, to talk with you and, and, and help you get across that line. Um, remember how this is important to you and share that with your friends, that what an omnipresent God, Savior, and Holy Spirit has done for you when you see people struggling with their own lives. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, we thank you for this message this morning. Lord, I, I, I thank you for um, bringing this to our attention. Sometimes we don't understand the attributes of God, Lord, and what they mean to us. And it takes a deep dive. And even sometimes then, they are not clear to us. And we thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit who does make that clear. Um, I pray if there's anybody here this, this morning that uh, needs to finalize the deal, so to speak, Lord, to, to finally come and say to you, um, I submit myself to you. I accept grace and your faith. Um, I repent of the, the life that I've lived and the things I've done to this point. I pray, Lord, that um, I can be brought into your presence, and that you would love me and, and make me a brother and a friend. I ask, Lord, that as we, we hear these in, in our church and our services, Lord, that we take them to heart and, and spread this good news. We're all bad people, Lord, and we all need a Savior, and that we can just uh, people would see that light into us and come to us. We thank you, Lord, for the service and, and for the praise that we have this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, we come now to the time of giving, and since I usually get to do that, I'll do that as well. Um, I, and now that I have the bully pulpit, um, I'm just going to make a, a couple comments. Uh, I served for um, nine years as the, um, the board chair of this church from, from the very beginning, so I've been in the business side of this church for a long time. 
Uh, if you guys are watching the giving versus the budget, you can see we're, we're not anywhere near it. Um, there was an amazing event happened that some of you may not be aware of uh, the, the summer before COVID hit that Duke Energy came in and uh, offered to buy uh, rights to our part of our property and put up some, uh, some poles, electric poles. And uh, through God's um, amazing interjection and, and uh, our negotiating efforts, uh, Duke was $450,000, which we tithed right away. We gave $45,000 away to the ministries that we, that we work on. And I'll tell you what, uh, God being omniscient, he saw this pandemic coming, and he saw that we were going to need this money if we were going to stay here. Um, so my, in my opinion, God wants a church on this corner, and right now, we're the church that he wants to be here. So we're able to supplement our, our, our shortfall of uh, the funds that we're, we're giving on a weekly basis, and we can go for a long time this way, but it's not sustainable. Um, God has a plan for us around our finances and our giving. Um, so I would, I would just ask that you look at that, pray about that. God tells you over and over and over that he's going to take care of you. If you're, if you're um, um, giving of your finances, his, he's going to be giving with his blessings. And this is not a prosperity gospel at all. Um, and there's another way. If we have some more people in this, in this congregation, then the giving will go as well. So my, my two requests are pray about your own giving and pray about who can you invite to this church, not just because of what they can give, but from, from what they can get from our city of Jesus Christ. So let's pray for our, our offering this morning. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've given to us. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your provision. And the greatest provision we thank you for is your son, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that um, we would be that active person, that, that light on the hill, Lord, that uh, people would see us and come to us and ask us where our light comes from and we can share Jesus Christ with them. I pray, Lord, for a, um, uh, that you would control all of our, our lives, uh, including our finances, Lord. You give us the, the, the will and security to, to step up in faith and give when we didn't think we could. And we know, that, Lord, that you don't need our money, Lord, but, uh, but uh, that you would uh, need us to be giving people in all of our areas of life. I, I, I thank you, Lord, for the people that are here this morning. I ask you to bless the givers and to bless these uh, gifts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.